Today we're going to be introduced to a number of kings and a lot of names. And that's what, that's what happens when we study history, right? Passing that history exam was so tough because you had to remember all those names. Well, let me encourage you, remembering the names of all these kings is not the primary issue here. What God has to say about them is what's important. See, this is going to be more than a lesson in history. As each king walks out onto the stage of human history and sort of stops for a moment under the divine spotlight, we're going to either read this oft-repeated statement, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, or every once in a while we're going to read, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, beginning here in chapter 14, we pick up the account of Jeroboam, king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And we read here at verse 1, at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And with that, we're told this rebellious king sends his wife in disguise to the prophet of God to find out whether or not their son is going to recover. At the sound of her approaching footsteps, we're told the prophet identifies her and he goes ahead and gives her the bad news. Their son will not survive his illness. But then the prophet makes an interesting comment here in verse 13, indicating that the child's death is actually a blessing for him because he's going to be spared a lot of turmoil and bloodshed and grief. The prophet says this, For he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found something pleasing to the Lord in the house of Jeroboam. In other words, out of everybody in Jeroboam's family, only this one boy evidently had a heart for God, and God brings him home. Well, the prophet then informs Jeroboam's wife that God is going to raise up another king, and that king is going to put an end to Jeroboam's dynasty. Verse 16 tells us that judgment on All of Israel eventually is going to happen because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and made Israel to sin. Well, after a a 22-year reign, Jeroboam dies and his son Nadab succeeds him. And here at verse 21, the narrative shifts over to Judah's king, Rehoboam. Now, remember, the nation is divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom referred to as Israel, and the southern kingdom referred to as Judah, which holds the city of Jerusalem as its capital. For 17 years, while Rehoboam reigned as king here in Jerusalem, verse 22 says, Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. His wicked reign experiences an invasion by Egypt, which is going to take a significant toll on Judah, including, now according to verse 26, the loss of the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. Now, eventually Rehoboam dies and his son Abijam takes the throne here in Jerusalem. But sadly, as chapter 15 opens, we're told here in verse 3, Abijam walked in all the sins that his father did before him. He only reigns for three years, and his son Asa follows him to the throne. Now, maybe you're thinking, Stephen, you know, I'm never going to remember all these, these names. There's just too many of them. Well, I don't blame you. But now we come to someone that I believe is worth remembering. And let me tell you, the biography of Asa is a breath of fresh air in the midst of all this, all this pollution. I mean, just listen to what verse 11 says. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as David his father had done. How great is that? I mean, finally, somebody does what's right. We're told here that he removes all the religious prostitutes, all the idols from the land. 
He even banishes his grandmother, the wicked queen mother, who had led the people in worshiping a false goddess. Over in the parallel account of 2 Chronicles chapter 14, we're given even more details of Asa's reign. Verse 4 informs us that Asa commanded Judah to seek the Lord and to keep the law. He also fortified Judah's cities. He defeated a million-man Ethiopian army, if you can imagine, because he cried out to the Lord in faith. Then here in chapter 15 of 2 Chronicles, we're told that Asa leads his people to rededicate their lives to the Lord. Unfortunately, however, over in chapter 16 of 2 Chronicles, we find out that later in life, Asa relies on an alliance with the Syrian king Ben-Hadad rather than continue trusting the Lord as he confronts you know, the aggression of this kingdom. Now, even though the northern opponents are sent scampering back home, Asa is rebuked for his alliance by the old prophet Hanani, who comes and delivers this classic verse to King Asa. In fact, it's, it's, it's worth memorizing here in verse 9. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. Now, despite the fact that Asa failed in certain areas, like we all do, he remains faithful to God and the kingdom of Judah is blessed to have this godly king for 41 years. Well, now the chronology takes us back to 1 Kings chapter 15, where we're told about the kings who reigned over Israel during the time King Asa was reigning over Judah. Verse 26 tells us, Jeroboam's son Nadab walked in the way of his father and in his sin. And after just two years as king, Nadab is assassinated by a man named Basha, who then proceeds to kill all the house of Jeroboam here in verse 29. By the way, this fulfills the prophecy back in verse 10 of chapter 14 that the Lord would cut off from Jeroboam every male, ending his royal dynasty. Well, because Basha too walks in the way of Jeroboam in sin, the Lord promises here in verse 3 of 1 Kings 16 to utterly sweep away his house as he had Jeroboam's. Basha is going to reign for 24 years. He'll be succeeded by his son Elah. But after just two years, Elah's servant Zimri kills him. And then he kills all his household and fulfills the word of the Lord. So Zimri is now king, but he reigns only for a grand total of seven days. Seven days into his reign, Omri the commander of Israel's army chases him into his palace where he's left without any possible escape. So Zimri sets his own palace on fire and dies himself in the flames. I mean, if this sounds like a horror movie, well, it was. Well, General Omri is now king and, and he too is an evil man. Verse 26 tells us he walked in all the way of Jeroboam. Now, Amri happens to be uh, the king known for building the city of Samaria, which becomes Israel's capital. So you've got the kingdom of Judah headquartered in Jerusalem, and now you've got the kingdom of Israel headquartered in Samaria. Amri is also known for being the father of Ahab, one of the most wicked kings in all the history of Israel. In fact, verse 31 tells us, Ahab took for his wife Jezebel, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. <laughs> wow, how's that for a resume? He succeeded in making God angrier than any other king had been able to do before him or after him. Now, after all this information, if you're feeling a little dizzy, I understand. I am too. You may not remember the names of these kings, but I want you to remember this key principle. No matter who they were 
or what they did, what mattered most was whether or not they walked with God. Beloved, what's your resume look like today? Well, let me tell you, no matter what you do in life, no matter what your title is at work, no matter what kingdom you you might even rule over, when the dust of history settles, the only question that matters is this, did you walk with God? Oh, my friend, walk with God today. Well, until next time, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.